Today we're going to be talking about sustainability in engineering. But what exactly does sustainability mean? So there are lots of different ideas and levels of understanding as to what sustainability actually means. It's a term often used to describe how environmentally friendly a product or a process is. And this is accurate to some certain extent. And we've all seen advertisements on, on TV for tea and food. Um, and some person at the end is smiling and saying it's made from 100% recycled products. Um, but what, is it, what does it mean? What does sustainability actually mean? What does what's the term mean? So uh, a quick question and answer session here, and you can type these into the, into the, answer, the answer box at the bottom of the screen. So what comes to mind when you hear the word sustainability? What do you think of first? So I'll let you guys, I'll give you guys a minute. Just to, the very first thing that comes to your head, comes into your head, what do you think about when somebody says is something sustainable or not? Let's see, do we have any, any input so far? I don't think we do, do we? Oh, we do, we have loads of them here. Okay, so renewable energy, yeah. Uh, renewable global warming prevention, very good. Reusable, yeah. To move forward and to progress without compromising the future, very good. Um, a resource that can be used without running out, yes. Using resources cautiously, the environment, renewable, renew reusable and recyclable long lasting. So a lot of you are getting the general gist of it. We're getting a lot of renewable, recyclable, reuse, um, a process that can continue for ex uh, an extended period of time. So these are all fantastic, um, fantastic, and they're just pouring in here, everlasting green energy. Yeah, very good. So um, let's just go back to my uh, screen here. I'm just going to close that off for a second. So. What I, I put together some words that I connect with sustainability. So we, most people had the environment, climate change, natural resources, renewable energy, renewable materials, recycling, waste, circular economy, education, society, innovation, and engineering. Most importantly, engineering as this is engineering week. Um, but there's a very, very simple and straightforward definition as to what sustainability is. It's the, uh, it's, you know, um, to, to, you know, um, do something without consequence in the future. So to be able to keep using a particular resource and it's never going to run out or to be able to um, emit certain emissions and they're not going to be able to um, affect our, our, our society or our environment. So all of these are really, really good answers. And this is why it's important. Why is this idea of sustainability so important? Well, on our on our screen here, if you look back, I was born in 1974, so in there there was just under four billion people on the planet. And if we look up here to where are we now? We're about 2020, so there's close to eight billion. By the time we get to 24, 2040, there'll be nine billion. So there'll be over twice as many people on the planet as there were when I was born. So you can understand that we have to share the resources on the planet and we have to look after our environment. And this is why it's sustainability is really important. But what has sustainability got to do with engineering? Well, here we're back at our planet and somewhere just right about there is DCU. And in that lovely building there, the Stokes building, is the School of Mechanical and Manufacturing Engineering. Now in normal times, there would be a, um, a, a whole beehive of, of researchers and students there um, inventing the next doohickey. And um, there I am working on a prototype for one of our inventions. Um, so what does engineering have to do with sustainability? Well, as mechanical engineers, we're always looking to become sustainable in our designs and our solutions. We, 
we ask questions like, how can we make a product lighter, stronger, smaller, but still be able to do twice the work? We, how can we make materials last longer so that we have to use less of them over time? How can we improve the efficiency of engines and motors so that they use less energy and produce less harmful emissions? Engineers and scientists are at the background of all of these questions. But this is only part of the story. In DCU, we go just that little bit further. In the School of Mechanical and Manufacturing Engineering in DCU, we have what's called the Sustainable Systems Energy Group. And in there, there's a team of researchers that specialize in developing more sustainable materials, products, systems, services, transportation, and energy. These are uh, the focus of a lot of our work. And we have to deal with three classes of problems. So we've got to deal with the past, the present, and the future. So the past. How do we deal with products that were designed 20 years ago and are now reaching the end of their service life? So how can we make recycling and reuse easier, cheaper, and using less energy? How do we best use technology to improve the products and systems we have right now and reduce our emissions and resource use? And as an example of this, I'm going to just um, tell you a little bit about a project that we're working on here in DCU at the moment. So here we have uh, wind turbines. There we go. Um, and wind turbines are almost completely, um, well, produce almost completely 100% renewable energy. There's no such thing as absolutely 100% renewable, but it's very close. And that's great. Yay. But sometimes in colder environments, the ice builds up on the blades of our wind turbine and that slows them down and they produce less energy. And sometimes the, the weight can actually damage the blade. And then there's a whole cost of having to go and get a boat out to somewhere in the North Atlantic and, and uh, replace some of the wind turbine blades. And that's not great. So at DCU, we're working on a project that uses nanotechnology. Oh, the other nanotechnology. There we go. To modify the chemical properties on the surface coating of the blades. And what that does is it makes them hydrophobic so that the, the water and the ice and the snow can't stick to them. But it also makes them tougher so that if we had, you know, big hailstones or, or big chunks of ice coming, they're not going to do as much damage as they would. And therefore, we reduce the amount of resources that we use to repair them. So that's just an example of some of the present work we're doing at DCU. So in the future, the questions we're asking as engineers, how can we design products and services now that produce zero waste for the future? Down with that sort of thing. Um, that are made from 100% renewable material and that use 100% renewable or reclaimed energy. And of course, I just told you five minutes ago, there's no such thing as a 100% renewable energy. So you can ignore that last one. So that is all from me, um, nice and short and sharp. Do you guys have any questions before I hand you over to our next speaker? I'm just gonna check the Q&A box. Okay, so we've no questions so far. So I am going to hand you over to Dr. James Carton, who's going to talk to you about some of the work we do in sustainable transport. And it's over, oh, we have a question. How does nanotechnology work? Okay, well, um, I, I have time, I think, to answer this. So nanotechnology is at a scale, it's so small, that we can actually affect or modify the chemistry of a material or the chemistry of a substance. Um, and we can, we can make that do, um, we can do lots and lots of 
of things, we can change characteristics of material. So in the example that we had, we can, we can make the, the material hydrophobic. We can also make other materials selective so that you know, it reacts in different ways with different parts of the environment. So in relation to into our group, our sustainability group, that's that's really where the main um, the, the main uh, uh, kind of workings of nanotechnology uh, is applied. So similarly for things like solar panels, where you would have ice or dust buildup or rain, eventually it, um, it blocks the transmission of the sunlight to the to the solar panels. And but with nanotechnology, we can we can avoid some of that. Not completely, but we can go. We can um, it can help towards um, the problem of of monkey solar panels. Um, okay, I think that was it. Yeah. No. So okay, we've been sorry. We've one more here. No, no. How does it work on the turbine specifically? Okay. Well, that's a longer question, and maybe if we have time, I'll, I'll answer that at the end. But for now, I'm going to hand you over to Dr. Carton. There's one more question, Greg, there. Sorry, what would you do in a typical day in your job? What would I do in a typical day in my job? Well, there is no such thing as a typical day in my job. It starts off with a, a task list of little jobs to do, and then by the end of the day, there's a different task list of different jobs for me to do. I will say that um, before I was a lecturer, I was a postdoctoral researcher, and I would spend the day, um, a lot of my days would be spent reading, 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 because um, it's really the only way you become an expert in whatever subject you are studying at the time. So like almost all academics, a lot of our time is spent reading now and again. Uh, we get to go down and do something in the lab, turning on some pumps, look at some water, or um, look at a laser, things like that. But a lot of my time, unfortunately, is spent reading. Dr. Carton will have a far more exciting day's agenda to speak with you about. Over to you, James. Uh, thank you, Greg. Uh, um, good introduction into sustainability and uh, good afternoon everybody. Um, I see we have over 150 people I think online so so, uh, so you're all very welcome. I'm going to for the next 10 minutes talk about what I do from day to day um, and um, as assistant professor in, in DCU and, and I work with um, Irish companies, Irish people, Irish researchers and also I work with uh, colleagues across Europe and across, uh, across the world actually in different energy projects. So I'm going to get straight in, and so please prepare yourselves to type some stuff into the um, into the uh, question answer. So I'm going to look at different modes of transport and, and basically talk about transport and sustainable transport a little bit today. So what I want you to to actually um, put up in your in the question box here is just <clears throat> explain to me when when you go back to school in a couple of weeks' time, how are you going to get to school? Are you going to walk? Are you going to cycle? Are you going to rollerblade, scooter, train, bus, car? Um, carpool, great. By walk, great. So I'm getting loads of different um, answers here. Oops. Um, car, 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 bus, walk. So, wow, there's loads of... Uh, so you are all very sustainable, it looks like. A lot of you are. So really, this is actually kind of a, a part of our engineering job is to understand what people do actually and then develop infrastructure around them. So if, if lots of people in a city walk and cycle, we should develop walking and cycle activities. And that is actually really better for, um, for our emissions, reduce our emissions. We don't have to build uh, roads then and we don't have to park our cars on, our, on the motorways to get into town. So part of an engineer is actually looking at our problem, asking the people, ask the public and how they, how they get around, for example, with transport. So, so some of you actually said you've got the bus and that's really good. Public transport is again, a really good way of um, moving people around very efficiently um, and actually reduces emissions. So you can put lots of people that are in single cars into, into, a, into one bus or even a carriage of a train. So what I'm gonna show you today really is, is kind of talk a little bit about sustainable transport. And in this diagram here, this is kind of a, a, a scientific diagram. It's called a Sankey diagram. But what it tells us really is in our energy system, we have a lot of energy going in. So some of it is 
fossil fuels, oil, coal, and gas. And we have a little bit of wind and solar that comes in and a little bit of hydro. But what I'm gonna talk about today is this transport side. Unfortunately, there's a lot of emissions from our transport, our cars, our buses, our trucks, our airplanes, um, they produce a lot of emissions. And again, not good for the environment, not good for climate change, and definitely not good for your health if you ever um, walk by uh, uh, the footpath and a, and, a, and a truck drives by you. So we were looking at actually seeing what solutions we can actually come up with from an energy point of view, a transport point of view. So the good news is fossil fuels are aiming to go into decline. Now we have to push harder on this for this to happen. But certainly a lot of cities across Europe and the world are actually banning fossil fuels um, vehicles in their cities. But what this is going to do is put pressure onto car manufacturers to actually uh, make cleaner, cleaner options, make the cities more livable, and make cities more um, uh, accessible for people. So a lot, of, a lot of you actually put in walking, cycling, dart, taxi. Um, so actually those type of modes of transport should be promoted. And the other bit of good news is actually that our EU is actually putting up some policy in relation to making public transport um, a lot of that zero emission. So this is really going to impact you, uh, the technology, the, 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 the buses you get on, the uh, trains you get on, and actually even the taxis you get um, around the city. They're going to be really affected over the next couple of years because of this EU directive. And very few of them will be, will be fossil fuels uh, over the coming years. And this is really good news. So let's think about what kind of options we have. Well, there's not that many, to be honest, certainly when we go zero emission. So we have these zero emission capable uh, cars called hybrids. But again, they only get you so far and they still actually use some fossil fuels. So that might be wiped away. We mightn't have many of those uh, in our public sector. But then we have these other two options. And this is um, the electric car and hydrogen car. Now, the top car is actually my car. I took a picture of this this morning, parked outside my house charging. Uh, and the picture below is actually me when I was in um, I was in a in in the Netherlands with a colleague actually, and he was testing test driving this new car called called a, a hydrogen car. We actually um, drove that around the the uh, the city and and around the country, and it was really really good. So I'm going to introduce you to kind of electric cars and hydrogen cars, and actually more importantly, electric and hydrogen mobility, and actually more importantly, electric and hi hydrogen transport or public transport because that's actually where we need to reduce emissions we need to forget about our cars our individual cars and think about active individual transport um, and and uh, and uh, trains and buses that are zero emission um, there's a question here actually about a tesla unfortunately uh, my boss in dcu doesn't pay me enough money so i can't afford to buy a tesla but, uh, but certainly Tesla, they're, they're a lovely car and they're electric and they're, and, and again, the, um, they have zero emissions from the tailpipe. So that's really good. So what I want to kind of get across is that zero emission is really hard for engineers. Making transport zero emission is really tough. So actually a really good idea is actually um, going electric. Electric allows that there's no tailpipe emission, but still we have our, 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 our vehicles able to move around. And I don't know if you've ever heard of hydrogen before, uh, but a hydrogen car effectively is an electric vehicle. It has, instead of a, a big battery, it has a small battery, hydrogen tank, and then it converts that hydrogen to electricity via fuel cell. And that actually runs electric motor. So they're, they're very similar to electric vehicles. So I want to talk to you a little bit about these vehicles. So this is going to co coincide with actually my colleague's presentation in a few minutes. She's going to talk about, Lauren is going to talk about water and how, how important water is and how we actually purify it. But I want to actually talk about let's split water, and uh, like you, like you've possibly done in your science projects in school, where you've actually put electricity through water and produced hydrogen and oxygen. And if you haven't done that yet, please ask your science teacher to do that as an experiment in the lab. It's really good fun. So the oxygen is what we breathe. So the fact that we're breathing here today is thankful to oxygen. But the hydrogen actually is a really interesting fuel. We can actually use that to produce electricity if you want, or we can burn it. So where we produce the hydrogen is we actually produce it from renewables. So now we're actually producing something that's not from fossil fuels. We're producing the energy from our renewables. We're putting that electricity into water and then we're getting hydrogen and oxygen. And we're actually going to use that hydrogen to actually power our vehicles. And the really benefit for hydrogen above battery 
is that hydrogen allows it to be a fuel. So actually we can charge our tanks a lot faster. A range of our vehicles, our buses, our trucks can be twice, three, four times long, further than an equivalent battery. So again, we have, we have options here around zero emissions and hydrogen and battery electric are two options. So I see there's some questions coming in here in relation to safety. And this is actually one of the things as engineers we really have to be concerned around is actually trying to understand this technology because it's new technology um, and actually learn from it. So as, as engineers, as researchers, we got to get a lot of people. This slide here shows, I don't know, 15 companies that we pulled together. Um, and basically these companies were wanting to learn. They want to see how safe hydrogen was. We want to learn from the technology, see how it was produced. And so we, we pulled all this group together and we jumped on, on or brought this bus into Ireland, the first hydrogen bus in Ireland. And this was on the road in um, October, November, December, just gone in 2020. Um, and we even stopped outside DCU. We did lots and lots of road testing. And again, DCU is, uh, you know, the first university in, 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 in Ireland to actually run one of these buses uh, on our campus. And we did lots of road testing. We had, the, we had this bus over by the airport doing, uh, doing shuttle runs. We had it up in Ashburn, if anyone's in, in from Meath, and we had it out to Ashburn uh, on, a, on, a, on a long commuter trip route. In the city centre from the West Dublin, I don't know if you know the, the St. Peter's uh, Road Roundabout, it's a very, it's a very busy uh, area, going the whole way through the city over to, um, over to Fisborough. And we also had the bus then going around DCU. We had it connecting our campuses, and that's again a thing that we try to do in, in, in DCU and as researchers, is trying to build on our communities and build on our research. So what I'm kind of looking at is, I'm still asking the questions, what, where's our zero emissions coming from? How are we going to reduce emissions? And as an engineer, I'm looking at options, and I'm looking at electric, and I'm looking at hydrogen, and I'm asking what is safe, what is useful, and what's good for different applications. And certainly we see there's a future for hydrogen, certainly in buses and trucks where we need extra range and we need to carry our goods and our passengers. And again, this reduces emissions in our cities. So what I'd say is the short answer here is we need more engineers and we need sustainable um, at the key of our engineering decisions. And I think within uh, interactions like this, I think it's really good that you at this young age actually gets to understand that these open questions, actually becoming the engineer solves a lot of problems. So if there's, I'm going to have a quick look at the questions here before I hand it over to my colleague. So, um, oh, um, what attracted me to sustainable, and there's a question here, what attracted me to sustainable engineering? I think that's actually a question we leave to the end for the three of us actually. Um, and with Trevis will answer that maybe, maybe, maybe together at the end. Um, yeah, so the, the whole idea of making something, making an electric vehicle or making a hydrogen vehicle, it has to be sustainable. And actually how we make it and where we make it and, and the, the, the emissions of actually doing that is actually something actually need to, um, need to understand. And I think that's one of the things as engineers do. We try to understand the whole process of making it and do where, from where we get the materials, from where we mine them out of the ground to where we looked at, for example, in Greg's study, where we actually recycled them at the end of use. Um, so hydrogen, so then there's a safety question here, are hydrogen cars safe? Well, that was one of the things we're looking at. Hydrogen is a, is a very um, uh, flammable fuel. And actually, again, very similar to any other things we deal with, we have to see is, is, it, is, it, is it able to be used safely? And again, so far, so good. We actually are, have the technology and the capability to do it in a very safe manner. So hopefully that works well with us in the future. And then I have a question here from um, um, on, 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 a, on the Hyundai Ionic. Um, yeah, so, so actually the car I, I have actually is a Hyundai and, and actually it's the Ionic and, and it's a fantastic electric vehicle and it does me from day to day. But I think as we go into bigger vehicles, I think, um, you know, electric tends to be a little uh, really good for some applications, but other applications, hydrogen comes in. So again, it's the engineering question is how they fit together. And we have solutions for both options because we do need zero emissions and we need those solutions to come from. So again, I think that's a lot of the, um, the questions. And um, if there's any more, I'll come at the end of the talk. So from now, I'm going to hand it over to my colleague, um, Dr. Lorna Fitzsimons, um, who's going to talk about clean water. So thank you very much. 
Hi everybody, you're all very welcome again. It's great to see so many of you joining and thanks to my colleagues Greg and James for their earlier presentations. So again, um, I'm a lecturer like Greg and James in the School of Mechanical and Manufacturing Engineering here in Dublin City University. And my particular area of research, as James mentioned, is water and energy. So just to go back onto a couple of things that Greg was talking about earlier, we can think of sustainability using a number of different definitions. So one definition of sustainability that you may, have, you may be familiar with comes from the Brundtland Report, and that says that sustainability means that it's development that, means, that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. As you can imagine, it involves a very wide range of issues from food, water and energy availability, the use and depletion of natural resources and maintaining those natural resources in, in good order, climate change, population growth, poverty and economic growth and economic activity and society. So water and energy are actually very strongly connected. Water is required to produce electricity and extract fossil fuels. And just a couple of numbers for you, 52 billion cubic meters annually of fresh water is used for energy production. So that's, that involves electricity generation and fossil fuel extraction. And research from China estimated that every unit of electricity produced, so in terms of one kilowatt hour, requires 6.33 litres of water on average. So this diagram here just shows a typical power generation plant. So there's a closed loop of water. So the water is heated using, typically using fossil fuels. The water is boiled, is converted to steam. The steam rotates against a turbine and generates electricity. So we have that closed loop of water, which needs to be refreshed every now and again. And then we have a cooling water loop that's used in the condenser. So we have water both in the electricity generation loop and water to cool the condenser. So that's the water requirement for energy. So let's have a look now at the energy requirement really to treat and produce water. So energy is required to produce water for drinking, for agriculture, for industry, for energy, as I said earlier, and to treat wastewater, for example, sewage, before it can be discharged to the environment. So just a couple of more stats for you. So based on EU water demand, we can break it down into different sectors. So in the EU, agriculture takes, pretty much uses 44% of the energy that we produce. Industry and energy will use about 40%, and public water supply accounts for 15% of water demand. So where does this water come from? Well, 97% of the water on earth is in our oceans. 3% is fresh water. 2.5% is locked in glaciers and is otherwise inaccessible. So really when we look at it, only 0.5% of the water on earth is readily available. So because of this increased demand, as Greg mentioned, because of population growth, industrial activity, because of this increased global demand for water, we've now turned to using seawater as one of the main producers of the fresh water that we, we use. And desalination is now widely used to, project, to produce this fresh water from seawater. So there's a couple of different technologies that are used for desalination. One relates to thermally driven processes, and these are called multi-stage flash and multi-effect distillation. So these would be, I'm sure you've probably done them in a, as a science experiment, where you get salty water, you boil it, the fresh water evaporates, you condense that fresh water and then you collect it. That's a thermally driven process, but the most widely used process currently is reverse osmosis. And the reason why reverse osmosis has become so popular is because it has reduced energy requirements than the thermally driven processes. So although they're low relative to thermally driven processes, they still require quite a lot of energy. 
So at the moment, approximately 60% of desalination technologies will use reverse osmosis. So let me just stop here and see if I have any questions before I carry on. Um, so there's a very big question here. <laughs> Do you think we will be able to survive on sustainable and reusable energy alone? <laughs> That is a, a very good question and a much broader societal question, really. Um, I can't really answer that, to be honest. I think that, yes, we need to use as many sustainable resources as we can, but we also need to look at how our society functions and how we consume resources. So I'll leave that one for the end. <laughs> that, that's the hard question. Um, do I think underwater turbines could work? Yes, underwater turbines have been used. There's tidal turbines. And there's different technologies. One is called an oscillating water column, which is used to harness energy from water. A huge amount of water is usually used to produce meat and meat-based products. Um, are there any alternatives that are more sustainable? I should put my daughter on to you for this one. Um, my daughter is a staunch vegan, and I get this lecture all the time. Yeah, no, we do need to look at sustainable ways of food production and we need to look at them holistically as well. So that's, that's a very good question. Um, is a career in this area well paid? It's not enough to buy a Tesla, but it's, it's, not, <laughs> it's not too bad either. We would argue it's, it's not enough, but um, no, in general, it's, it's, it's a well paid area. Ireland is an island and very suited to generating hydroelectricity from the sea and tides. Why don't we have plants to generate tidal energy? Yet yeah, tidal energy and ocean energy is an area that's very much under development at the moment. There are a lot of um, projects which have started. I'm not really sure how far along a lot of those technologies are in Ireland. I know there was a big tidal project, I think up in Northern Ireland, but I can, I can come back to you on that one. Um, is it a career in demand and needed more in the future? I think it is a career in demand. Oh, sorry, Anya, go ahead. No, sorry, go ahead there, Lauren. I was just pressing answering live, so the person will know it's been answered. Okay, perfect, sorry. Um, is this career in demand? I, I would think so. And I think it's even going to become more in demand as, as people realize just how vital this area of research and activity is. Um, how do you, th oh, well, this is a question now. <laughs> how do I think asteroid mining and getting resources from space will fit into sustainability and the future? Again, really good and interesting question. Um, I've never really thought about it, if I'm honest. Perhaps we might leave that. James, do you want to jump in there? Yeah, actually, um, really good question. So one of the inter and there's a few questions here that I'm trying to type back to in relation to resources. One of the really interesting things of why electric vehicles, hydrogen vehicles, even uh, turbines, they use a lot of magnetic materials um, and really rare rare earth elements, rare materials that are that, that are really hard and expensive to find on Earth. So as for now, electric vehicles are expensive. Hydrogen vehicles are more expensive and you know, it's expensive to go clean because materials are expensive. But I was actually working with a uh, European Space Agency project two years ago on actually looking at um, asteroid mining and actually looking at resources that are on the moon. And again, this is an active program within the European Space Agency where they're actually looking at, um, you know, options more than just sending a person to the moon so they can put up a flag, actually getting resources there and understanding what's there. Um, so I think I think it's it's definitely uh, in a year that the European um, uh, Space Agency opened up their um, astronaut recruitment. I think this is a really vibe, a valid question, and who knows uh, what we'll find if it's if the value of bringing those expense materials back to Earth is is there, it'll happen. It may not happen for the next decade or two though. James, just while you're there, there's a question. Uh, do you think that hydrogen planes will be a thing of the near future? Actually, this, this comes to the question that I uh, think I typed back um, the definitely yes. So this goes back to will, will we ever have an energy system that's 100% renewable uh, slash sustainable? And we have to, the answer has to be yes. And then this comes into actually some work that we're doing on models and we're actually looking at a system like this. We're looking at we're bringing in aviation. Aviation is really difficult. Aviation, airplanes have to be light. They have to, to be long distances. And again, we want them to be zero emission or low emission. 
So we're actually looking at turning, creating what we call synthetic fuel. So instead of pulling fossil fuels out of the ground and making, making uh, putting that into airplanes, what we'd have is actually we'd have, we'd capture carbon from the air, we join it with hydrogen, which we produce from renewable energy and create actually the same chemical. Um, and if you learn in my, or in myself and Lauren actually have a, have a, have a module in second year where we teach about thermodynamics. And the one thing we realize is that um, um, jet engines are really efficient. They're really efficient thermodynamically. So, so we, we're not gonna get rid of them very soon, but we do have to get rid of the emissions. So if we can create this um, greener, cleaner fuel for airplanes, I think that's a way of doing it. But again, we also have to think about reducing our travel a little bit more sustainable from our, our ethics uh, side, not just you know business as usual. Okay, um, I'm going to, we might just leave the rest of the questions to the end, if that's okay. So I'm just gonna carry on with just the remainder of this part of the presentation. So I had mentioned that reverse osmosis has become very widely used for seawater desalination. And again, to meet the increased demand for fresh water. So some of you will be familiar with these terms. Um, osmosis, you might've come across it in school. So osmosis is a natural phenomenon. So if I have two containers with water, one with fresh water and one with salty water, and they're separated by a semi-permeable barrier or a membrane, what will happen is that nature loves equilibrium. So because these two solutions are at different concentration, fresh water will pass through the membrane to the salt water side until the concentrations are equalized. Now we can use that principle and, and think about it. And if we do that and apply a pressure on the salt water side, so apply a, a high pressure on the salt water side, what happens is that the fresh water permeates through the membrane and leaves the salty water and the salt contaminants on the left-hand side, in this case, of the barrier. So we have osmosis on the left-hand side. And again, if we apply a high pressure, we have reverse osmosis then on the right-hand side. And this is just the scientific principle behind the reverse osmosis process. So typically having a look at a schematic or a diagram of the reverse osmosis process, we have our feed water, which could be seawater. We pressurize it using a pump. The seawater enters the reverse osmosis membrane. The fresh water will pass through the membrane and this is called the permeate water. And the salts are actually prevented from traveling through the membrane. So what we have is the seawater is split into two streams, a permeate water, which is very low concentration of salts, very high purity, and we have a reject stream, which is very concentrated. And this is called a brine stream. So as I said earlier, reverse osmosis has lower energy requirements than thermal processes. However, it still does require significant energy inputs. So in DCU, as part of our sustainability engineering group, we do research to improve the energy efficiency of the ORO process for different feed waters. 